Sunday sermon and decided to deliver the same sermon of the previous Sunday. So um, he climbed into the pulpit, faced the audience, and said, <coughs> and just said, I repeat last Sunday's sermon. <laughs> he descended, uh, went, went back to the altar, and went on with the Mass. Um, uh, I, I, I leave the, uh, the deep philosophical consequences of this gesture for Kierkegaard to, uh, to discern. And um, for my part, I will follow the steps of, of the good priest. And uh, instead of beginning by <coughs> saying how honored I am, um, to introduce our guest, uh, I will just uh, say, I repeat what we introducers usually do um, uh, when uh, performing these, uh, these acts, when delivering these short-lived speeches. Um, so, I will not even reveal the name of, of our guest. Uh, what I'm going to do, this, uh, this, this allows me to go direct to, to, to the centre um, of what I, I want to say, and which is, and uh, I'm going to follow the steps of, of another anti-philosopher um, and the indications of, of a very, very famous dictum uh, quote, you will know them by their works, end quote. So um, I decided to read the list of our guest's uh, works so that you can know him by, by his works. Um, for the sake of, of originality, I'm going to read it backwards. Right. And, uh, um, Moreover, rather than smoothly moving from one year to, to, to the next, or sliding from one year to the next, I will jump from, from one to the other, um, sort of at random. Right. Uh, sorry, cognitive metaphors. Uh, you saw that. Yeah. So, uh, they may be more or less eliminated. Um, so, 2010, Introducing English Language, 2009, Texture and Cognitive Aesthetics of Reading. Uh, perhaps we should rest for a while and consider a few of them. Reading lists is quite exhaustive, um, and I would like to to point out a couple of things, quite obvious, but <coughs> by the way, but if you if if, if you um, if you perform a, an experiment, uh, if we leave the room and, and knock at the doors of our colleagues and mention these two titles, without um, <coughs> uh, without of course saying mention the author, those who do not know the author, the first reaction will be, ah, two works by different people, by two different authors. And if you insist that in the title page of the book there is only one name, they would probably react saying, um, <coughs> ah, but you know there are uh, different people with the same names. 
And if you go on insisting and say, no, it is the same person, they will say, ah, case of schizophrenia. Um, <laughs> two specialists in one person. It is strange, it is quite rare. It is possible. Um, no, it is only one project. And it is what is called an interdisciplinary project. It's only one person, only one project. Actually, these two books are quite representative. They represent, in the sense of, that they represent a life project and they express an intellectual, let's say, an intellectual sensibility. Okay. Um, so, an interdisciplinary project. And also, two, two, two kinds of books. One, um, or two kinds of practices of writing books. Um, one, you can see in the title, is at a more intellectual level, and the other is uh, more theoretically biased. So this concern with uh, reaching uh, the audience to make accessible heart theory, difficult theory, is very clear throughout um, our guest's uh, career. <coughs> 2002, 2002, Cognitive Poetics. Here you can see again, if you compare this book with texture, uh, Cognitive Aesthetics and Reading, um, you can see again these two levels. One is more introductory, the other is more um, <coughs> theoretically biased. And there is no division, it should be clear that there is no division between, no, uh, no real division um, between, between the two. One uh, wants to make theory accessible, the other wants to make practice superior, because it is theoretically based. There is another thing that um, should be pointed out, um, despite the, the clear connection between the two books. Uh, there is a, a change of uh, focus. One is more, um, uh, one pays more attention to uh, interpretation of meaning, and the other is more concerned with the effects of the text. Texture, texture, uh, aesthetics refer, clearly refer, refers to, to this. <coughs> um, cognitive poetics is the epitome, if you like, of interdisciplinarity. Brings together literary criticism, linguistics, sociology, anthropology, neurology, biology, and all sorts, uh, all sorts of things. The, uh, uh, let's say the, the basic link for us, at least, is <coughs> literature and linguistics, and sometimes um, our guest um, uses the term literary linguistics. Perhaps cognitive poetics can be uh, too easily identified with literary criticism, uh, philosophy, and so on. And uh, well, it is just a way of um, of uh, emphasizing this, uh, the, the connection between uh, two, two fields. <clears throat> Cognitive poetics belongs to the tradition of stylistics, which is also another, <clears throat> another term that, um, that is used by our guest. Um, and it is, uh, you can see this, uh, this clearly in the title, again in the title, Texture. Cognitive aesthetics. You can see the two aspects of this tradition: the focus on the text, on the texture of the text, more particularly, and on the effect, on the effect of, of, of the text. <coughs> um, Two o eight. Uh, uh, the language of literature, uh, the language in literature, reader, is a, a collection of classic essays 
on stylistics, and it includes a reflection on the past and future of the discipline. 2007, contemporary stylistics as a collection of more recent essays uh, on the field. I'm going to mention now two other books which uh, give you an idea of the uh, institutional stature of, um, of our guest. 2007, he published the Routledge Companion to Social Linguistics. 2004, he published the language in uh, so, sorry, he published Language in Theory, which is uh, part of uh, the Routledge uh, English Language Introduction series, of which uh, he is general editor. So, you can make use of the co coffee break to make proposals. Um, we'll do it, you probably couple of hours to, to, to reach to the end, <laughs> the end of the chapter by, by this speed. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, but I, before I finish, um, I want to thank Professor Peter Stockwell for accepting to come to Santiago and uh, um, give us uh, and deliver the lecture or conduct the seminar or <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Manuel. Very, very kind. And thank you all, collectively, I guess, for, for inviting me here. Uh, it's always nice to be in a place that's so civilised that you don't have to apologise for looking at both language and literature um, in, in one breath, uh, which is not true in Britain, as I'm sure you know. Um, in many... Uh, Departments of English, not not you know, which is one reason why I wanted to work there many years ago. Um, in many departments of English, uh, the, the, there is a hard division between people who work in literary studies and people who work in linguistics to the extent that either if they're in the same department they don't talk to each other, um, or, or, they're, or they're physically different. And, I mean, I'm sure look different, but you know, they're, they're physically separated on the corridor. Or even I believe you had Paul Baker here yesterday from Lancaster. Um, in Lancaster, uh, there is a, a, a department of English, and there's a separate department of, of uh, modern English language and linguistics. And 20 years ago, in, in, a, in an exam board meeting, um, there was such a big argument between the literature people and the language people that the language people got up, left, and formed their own department. Um, and it's, it's, it's been like that ever since. And of course. Most of the people involved have either retired or died or left since, but there's still this sort of warring mentality in Lancaster. Um, so yeah, it's true that, uh, it's sort of true, not literally, that I am schizophrenic. Um, so, um, because I am a statistician, or, um, or I am a literary linguist, or I do work in cognitive poetics, or I see myself, I guess, as a literary critic as well. Uh, or see myself as someone working in poetics or the, 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 the long tradition of rhetoric, uh, two and a half thousand year old tradition. Um, and I see myself working partly in critical theory and I see myself as an applied linguist. And you, you, you'll understand that all of those answers of who I am depends on where I am in the world and who's asking the question. Um, so I just change the nature of what I am. Um, sometimes the danger in that, uh, of course, is that you end up knowing a little bit about lots of things and not one thing in any great detail. And certainly many of my co-researchers around the world have accused me of that as well. Um, so that's, that's the sort of warning, if you like, on, on, on what you get. Um, it's also true that the panel started off saying, oh, this, this, this name must belong to two names. And I, I often get, um, quite often, emails from students uh, mistaking me for the great American syntactician Robert Stockwell, um, uh, who I think must be in his 90s by now. Um, <laughs> so he published some, some great sort of generative syntactic work in, in the especially late 50s and early 1960s um, that I can't really take credit for, you know, because <laughs> even though I feel like I've aged quite a lot in the last few years, I don't think yet that I look 90, um, but the time will get me there. Um, 
Manuel's also right in, in the uncertainty of what this is. Um, so uh, this is a sort of lecture seminar workshop chat. Um, and if, if you let me just talk, this will be finished in about an hour. Um, so you've got to talk to me. Um, which is why I was trying to get everyone to come down the front, even though I'm, I apologise for the sort of theatrical lighting. Uh, but it's the only way that I could well, see the screen and see what I was doing. So I'm sorry that you're sitting in the dark a bit. Um, but uh, don't go to sleep. Okay. Um, let me just explain what I want to do in this session and, and in the next one. Um, <clears throat> so I call it a workshop, so there you go. That's, that's what we do. So between, between now and 12 o'clock, uh, I mainly want to talk about cognition as, and I've just realised I've spelt analysis wrong, cognition as discourse analysis. That's a good start, isn't it? Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> an analysis. Um, and I'm going to save the literary exploration largely for the second part of the session uh, from 12.30 onwards. But um, it's probably apparent to you from the sorts of things Manuel was saying that I don't believe there's a difference really between literary language and other sorts of language. I just think, I basically think everything's connected to everything else. Um, and that makes things talking, that makes talking about things quite difficult uh, because you have to sort of for convenience sake, separate things out, as we'll see in the rest of the morning. Um, some people, for, for many years, as you know, have talked about a literary language, uh, and it's and, and, you know, been many attempts, I guess, right back from the Russian formalists in the 1920s to, to say what a literary language was. Um, and I think most people now agree that there isn't any such thing as a literary language. There are different literary uses of different registers of language. Um, so you need to talk about what people do with the literature. You need to talk about genre, it's a genre analysis, or, or it's a readerly analysis, or it's a sociological analysis that allows you to say why people think that literature is special. Um, when, when you actually go and do the analysis of the language itself, you can almost always find the same sorts of features in a literary text somewhere else in the world, in, in a context where people would say, that's not literary. Um, so almost every definition of literary language that you can ever come across, someone has thought of a counterexample for it. That says, aha, that's not a literary feature, because look, here it is on a bus ticket, or here it is in an advertising uh, hoarding or television program, or, or, or children's speech, or whatever the feature is. Um, so in fact, even though I started off thinking, okay, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do non-literary stuff in the first bit, and literary stuff in the second, in fact, each bit has leaked into the other bit. Um, so there will be talk of literature in this session uh, and this afternoon, um, where we're mainly talking about literature, there will also be uh, a bit of political discourse as well. Um, all of this is on a handout. This should, you should have a three-page double-sided handout. Um, if you haven't got one, can you pass them forward? Has anybody not got a handout? Can you wave at my assistant at the back and she will give you a... Um, so all the texts are on there because I know it's difficult to appear in a screen. <clears throat> okay. As I'm sure you're aware, the vast majority of, of critical discourse analysis rests on systemic functional linguistics, where, where, it's, where the, the, the analysis is a linguistic one. Um, 80 or 90 percent, quite a high figure, almost all analyses uh, are Halliday and and in some way, um, and, and that's that's the tradition that I was brought up on. So when I was when I was learning critical discourse analysis, it was called critical linguistics in the early 1980s when I was learning it. But still, it became CDA. Um, when I was learning it in the 80s and early 90s, that there was there was no question that what you were doing was a Halliday analysis, a systemic functional analysis. Um, whether that was in the work of Paul Chilton or Norman Fairclough or Ruth Wardak or whoever it was, you know, whatever area was, was being looked at, um, that was the tradition. Uh, and all of those Australian researchers, uh, when Halliday went to Australia, um, picked up on that. And there's a huge tradition, I'm, you know this, don't you, of, of, of systemic functional linguistics in Australia. And the reason that uh, SFL is so good for critical discourse analysis is because um, it's got a really brilliant grammar, um, and it connects it to what's going on in the world. So it has the metafunctions. You know all this. Why am I even speaking this out loud? Um, 
it, it, it connects the two things together. And it works. Um, now, the trouble with me is that even, even, I'm always looking to try and do things slightly differently, because um, it seems to me that's, that's where interesting things happen. Um, and I'm always suspicious when something gets to be paradigmatic, because that means it's time that it wasn't anymore. Um, and so a few years ago I started thinking, um, actually triggered by something that Norman Fairclough said. Uh, he said, you know, it's, it's simply a matter of theoretical convenience that we use systemic functional linguistics in CDA. He said there's no necessary reason why that should be the only grammar that we use. And in fact, you know, other people have used other sorts of grammars. Uh, and a few years ago I came across uh, Ron Langacker's Cognitive Grammar. Um, now, Langacker's cognitive grammar is one of many cognitive grammars or construction grammars. Um, Langacker usefully distinguishes it from the other cognitive grammars by always writing it with a capital C and a capital G. Is that the right way around for you? Yeah. <laughs> Doing a G backwards is really hard. Um, yeah, it's like an E, isn't it? Um, so what I, what I wanted to do here was try and use Langacker's cognitive grammar to do critical discourse analysis. And I was going to say that isn't just an academic exercise, though of course it is an academic exercise. Uh, I think there's, there's a value in doing something just for the sake of doing it, to see whether you can do it. So I think that's actually quite valuable. Um, and the politicians of the world need to be told that doing things for their own sake is valuable still, uh, I think. Uh, even though we are also part of that discourse of social usefulness. Which I'll come on to later on as well. Um, so there's... There's a value in doing this for its own sake. It strikes me though that if you can do this, um, if you can use cognitive grammar to do critical discourse analysis, there are some advantages uh, to be gained. First of all, um, cognitive grammar in general claims a direct link with human psychology. So um, there are, there's a claim at least and I say that because it's certainly not proven yet by empirical evidence, but there's a claim that psychological structures that are observable uh, empirically have a straight line through to the sorts of theorising that happen in the, in the cognitive linguistics. Um, and therefore, if you're trying to produce, uh, especially a sort of qualitative model of critical discourse analysis, one that tries to get at how individual people are affected or manipulated or positioned or, or have some sort of effect from, from the texts that they're exposed to in the world, having a psychological dimension, especially one that's theoretically part of the model, seems to me a useful thing. Um, and it seems to me that if it works, it can do that better than systemic functional linguistics. Um, let's see. Because uh, I don't think it can do it that well yet. Uh, so this is this is sort of where we are, it seems to me. So let's try and give you an example. These are, these are old examples, actually from the critical linguistic tradition. Uh, I think the example is a bit more recent, but uh, you're familiar with all these. Here's, here's a sentence. These are all real. These are all natural occurring languages. Uh, these are for a newspaper um, headlines. Police shoot demonstrators at anti-capitalist rally. This is an alternative on the newspaper for the same day. Demonstrators are shot amid G8 riot. This is about two or three years ago. Um, now, you don't need me to tell you that a critical discourse analyst in instantly would say, ha-ha, look what's happened there. There's, there's, you can see the agency deletion. You can see that uh, the police aren't, aren't there at all in the second version. Um, that these demonstrators got shot all by themselves. Nobody did the shooting. They just got shot. They are shot. Uh, present tense, even. Um, they are shot. The, there was no process that led up to it. Um, there wasn't a process of shooting. It wasn't a narrative. Police shoot demonstrators somewhere. So X did Y in a place. This is just a thing happened. And it happened amid something bigger. Um, and the demonstrators are topicalized and, and are almost the, 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 the causes of their own shooting uh, in the second version. Um, so you can see that there's an instant ideological polarisation between those two versions of the same event. Um, this is another version that's even, even more uh, distant, if you like, from the, 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 the first one. Uh, Normalisation of the whole process. So 
the, the, the narrative that police shoot demonstrators or the narrative that, that sort of more statically demonstrators got shot, are shot, is just simply shooting. There was a thing, it's an abstraction. Um, shooting at demo, one dead, many injured. Uh, so again, it's the same event, but a different, a different angle on it. Um, and let me give you a different one, uh, just because I think this is so brilliant, whoever wrote this. Um, the Isra this is from uh, earlier in the year. The Israeli army say that one of its missiles attacked a convoy in Gaza and killed an admiral. Isn't that brilliant? Isn't that a brilliant piece of writing? Horrible, isn't it? But, but a brilliant piece of writing. Um, because it was the missile that decided to do this. No, nobody, no people were involved in this. One of its missiles um, did the attacking. It, attacked, it didn't attack people, it attacked a convoy. Uh, and then consequently uh, killed a nine-year-old boy. Um, and so we've got a huge distance between the definite, the Israeli army, and the indefinite. Uh, it's, it's a specific indefinite, but still it's framed as an indefinite. Uh, a nine-year-old boy, any nine-year-old boy, almost. Uh, and it's textually distant, those two things. So the Israeli army and the contact with a nine-year-old boy are about as far apart as you could possibly get. And in between is this horrible missile. They just decided to do something and did it. Um, and of course, look, look at the subordination. The Israeli army say that one of its missiles attacked a convoy and killed a nine-year-old boy. So it's syntactically separated as well. So what you've got here is an active form with the agency topicalized and themed. This is a functional analysis. A passive form with, with the agency deleted. Um, a normalized form with the agency deleted. And lastly, a reported form, there's no more sound effects, sorry. A reported form, I was just playing around, you know, you get caught up in power by doing. A reported form with agency deflected and subordinated. Now, um, what I've essentially done is more or less a functional analysis of that. I have got my pen out and done the sort of close structure and done it properly, but that, that's more or less what I've done. Um, now, it strikes me that you should be able to do what I've just said and show the ideological uh, motivations behind these and the, the probable positioning effects on an audience, on a readership. You should be able to do it in a cognitive discourse grammar, which doesn't actually exist yet, um, at least as well as systemic functional linguistic. So it's quite useful if you're trying to do something in a new way to already have a model that's pretty good because what it gives you is a benchmark of quality. Um, And that's where I'm headed. Um, I don't think we're going to get there today. So I just want to warn you, you know, just in case you think that by like two o'clock I'm going to say, ha ha, there it is. Um, I, don't, I don't think we're going to get that far. Um, what I think a cognitive grammar, uh, certainly if plugged into a discourse model, can do that systemic functional linguistics finds it difficult to do is talk about the emotional effect of those things. Now, I've put those up on a PowerPoint board in this room as part of a sort of academic event. But of course, um, so to a certain extent, I've taken them out of the context. Now, I think there's still that sense of, uh, certainly for me, um, annoyance and irritation and anger, and, and especially at the last one, um, because of the, as I see it, manipulation of what I would see as a better version of what happened. I don't want to get into that critical linguistic argument about the, the true version and distortions, but, you know, as, as a linguist. But as a person, as a linguist, as a person, um, <laughs> that annoys me, you know. Uh, I think it's a brilliant, I think it's a brilliant piece of writing. I think it's an appalling piece of writing because, because of what it hides for me, because, because how it doesn't match up with my political view of the, the, the situation in Palestine um, and, and, and for all sorts of other things. Now, what I want to be able to do is explain why this person feels really annoyed um, as part of the analysis. And I think traditionally there's been a separation between cool analysis and annoyance. Uh, what I broadly call aesthetics, though I'm, I'm very conscious and I'm using that in a different sense to the way it's used in philosophy. Essentially, emotional content, emotional attachment. Um, and I think cognitive grammar potentially can offer that angle on things. Um, it was basically what I was arguing in that texture book a couple of years ago. Uh, 
Okay. I'm going to stop now and ask you some questions. Um, do you know any cognitive grammar? Anyone? There's, there's a book. Um, there's a. <coughs> what an annoying step. There's a book by Ron Langacker. I think it came out in 2008. Uh, it's an Oxford University Press book called. It's a blue book. So. Uh, and it's called uh, Cognitive Grammar A Basic Introduction. Uh, and anyone who's read it knows that it's not an introduction and it's not basic. Um, it's 350 pages of unbelievably dense grammar with more diagrams than you could think it was possible that any publisher would ever allow. Um, and all, the diagrams are so tiny and so intricate that they make things more confusing than they would be if the diagrams weren't there. Which is one thing I always say to students. Why do you put a diagram out? Does it, does it save you words? You know? um, and for Ron Langacker, he loves his diagrams. Um, so, I'm conscious that this has been recorded and it's been pursued. <laughs> Sorry, but I apologise. It's a reading experience. Um, <laughs> anyone read that book? <laughs> I haven't sold it to you really, have I? Yes, mm -hmm. excellent, brilliant. No. I haven't read that book, but I read the two uh, grammar, cognitive grammars from 1987. Oh, right, okay, yeah. I don't, I use them. But I do not follow precisely that line of research. Okay. But I'm familiar. I'm Brilliant. Familiar. Okay, right. I'm going to use you later on. So. No. <laughs> you, shouldn't have, you, shouldn't have, you shouldn't have confessed. But yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a quick introduction to cognitive grammar. This is, this is going to be really stupidly quick. Now, what I want you to do is it, it, stop me. If there's anything you don't understand or anything you think that this is weird or strange, you will think it's weird or strange. Um, stop it. Because uh, you have to sort of suspend it. Yes. Can I ask you a question? Just of course. Yeah. Just a comment referring to these, to these examples. Okay? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as a judge about systemic functional linguistics, I, I work with systemic functional linguistics. Yeah. And it is true. I mean, if you analyze, I mean, you are focusing on the forms. You say active form, passive form, nominalized form, and reported form. But I think that systemic functional linguistics does more than that. I mean, it's a structural functional grammar. Yeah. It means that it not only does it analyze the forms, but also the functions in a specific context. So if we analyze these sentences in a particular context, I'm sure that you're going to get the emotional side that you say that cognitive grammar is going to add. Yeah. I think systemic functional linguistics also cares about, about the meaning of these sentences in yeah. particular contexts. Of course, if we analyze the sentences in isolation and we identify just the forms, we don't get to any emotional side. Sure. But no doubt, and everybody knows, I mean, systemic functional linguistics has a powerful system, grammatical system, and it does not only identify or focuses on the forms, yeah. it also focuses on the functions in particular contexts. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, yeah, of course, and, and obviously I've taken out the context in order to do it here. And, and, and you're right as well that the motivation of many people working in the field is precisely for that demystification or, or, or exposure of, of a political position. And, and I know that you know, the, uh, Ruth Wardak, for example, starts off and says, I believe this, that's why I do this. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you're absolutely right. Let me, let me change what I said then. Uh, let's try and make cogn a cognitive discourse grammar do it better. Okay. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. So that's a modification that actually makes my job harder, but yeah, that's all right. Um, okay, thank you. Um, right, basics of cognitive grammar. This, this, is, this is going to look very weird to anyone who's been trained in any sort of linguistics at all. Uh, especially, like me, if you come from a systemic functional tradition that's based on, on, on rank structure. So on uh, conveniently dividing up the language into uh, you know, different sort of random chunks from uh, uh, phonemes, morphemes, uh, lexical items, um, phrases, where are we going next? Uh, uh, thank you, yes, clauses, um, uh, text, is that next? Discourse, is that, it? Is that right? Have I done that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the analytical system follows that carving up of the linguistic world, doesn't it? So there are particular um, models that allow you to look at each of those step bits. And that's what I'm used to as well. Um, when you come to cognitive grammar, you've got to sort of set all that aside uh, and start thinking, now I know, I know that the functionalist part of systemic functional linguistics involves talking about what happened uh, 
as represented by a linguistic string. So I know that there is a sense that there's something in the world. Um, what I think cognitive grammar does is foreground that absolutely. So uh, let me go back to the absolute basics. Um, the very first thing that we learn as, as, as individuals is, are, are probably, this, this is all very speculative, spatial relationships. So actually, even before we're born, we move stuff around. And without getting too graphic, the stuff that we move around is bits of your mother. Um, I guess, uh, if you've ever had a, anyone who's ever had kids, you have know, you scan what you see is a little face. Don't you? <laughs> Push them. Um, and we learn to move things. So the very first things that our brains get wired up for uh, or start to develop are spatial relationships, physical spatial relationships. Things doing things to other things in particular ways, either directly or indirectly, or doing something to this which affects that. Uh, you know, so move, moving stuff. And you see that straight away in babies. As soon as they're born, babies are, babies are you know, within their sort of visual field about this uh, for the first few weeks. They're, 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 they're looking at catching their eyes things and moving things and pushing things. And one of the first cognitive breakthroughs that you make as a, as a baby uh, is realizing or, or having a consciousness and being able to repeat the fact that if you push something, it moves somewhere else. Isn't that amazing? You know, so you can sort of do that. Look, and it's now no longer where it was. And you remember where it was, because it was there, and now it's there, and it's not there, and it is now there, because you did something to it. That's amazing, isn't it? Isn't that fantastic? Uh, it's one of the very first things you learn. So, spatial dynamics are sort of psychologically foundational. Um, and there's loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of evidence for that. So even though, obviously, everything that you can ever say is only provisionally not wrong, um, if you're going to take a proper Popperian view of, of, of statements, it seems that that's sort of pretty safe to say what I've just said. Um, cognitive grammar is based essentially on that spatial relationship. So it says that um, everything else after that, everything about your mind, all of your consciousness, your emotional uh, life, um, your meaningful life, your intellectual life, everything uh, is a metaphorical extension or a physical extension or an elaboration of those basic fundamental physical facts. So when cognitive linguists talk about embodiment, it isn't a metaphor. They absolutely mean that it's rooted in your body. You know, that, that this, the fact that we're all about this high with eyes up here and, and sensations were basically a big bag of hot liquid under pressure. Um, that structures the way that, that we think uh, of the world and ourselves. Um, and there are cultural variations in that, and there are individual variations, and there are gender variations, but fundamentally there's a commonality to, to that uh, that's played out in lots of different languages, is the basic idea. So when it comes to grammar, um, People like Ron Langacker and Len Talby, who I've also referenced on, on, the, um, on, the, on the sheet, um, and I guess some early uh, Charles Fillmore stuff, uh, it's based on this idea that grammar is spatial, fundamentally, or that it's, it's, it's a metaphorical extension of that basic spatial idea. Uh, I think I put the references on the back of the sheet, didn't I? Um, yeah, there it is. I love that, that Charles Fillmore article from 1982 because it's published in a book called Linguistics in the Morning Calm. Isn't that um, It's a, a, a South Korean publication. Imagine doing a book that was called Linguistics in the Morning Calm. You, you've sort of won your audience over even before they start reading, haven't they, or something like that. Um, okay, so, uh, the idea is that any, any let's say any clause uh, consists of a thing moving in relation to other things. Um, and you can, you can break those down into different sorts of lexicalizations of that process. But fundamentally, every clause, every, every realized clause, consists of a thing um, describing a trajectory, a, a motion path, against something else. And Langacker calls this thing a trajector, a TR, uh, and the thing that it moves against, a landmark, an LN. Now clearly this is based on uh, visual field as well as spatial dynamics. It's basically about figure and ground. And that's not true, you know, figure and ground is, is, is fundamental 
in cognitive psychology, in cognitive science as well. Um, and just self psychology, I suppose, is where it comes from originally. So, you know, things, things take your attention uh, against other things. So at the moment, it's likely that your attention is taken by this thing here because I'm in the light, so I'm brighter than the rest of the room. I'm talking, which drags your attention. I'm now talking about myself being the focus of attention, so the sort of meta analysis of you talking to me, and now I'm doing that three ways, and now four, and now five. Um, and I'm moving, um, and I'm, cu I'm a curious anomaly in the room. Uh, I'm, I'm a weird thing. I'm a new thing. So you're probably not paying attention Unless, unless you are, of course, um, to the person next to you. So I should there, brilliant. That, that person there is writing on the woman next to us a piece of paper. And is therefore not paying any attention to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> See, so you can switch, obviously. But what, what she's done is just simply, I know, brilliant, um, is, 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 is switch figure and ground around. So in this case, what was the ground, that is her, that, that object next to you um, becomes the figure <laughs> temporarily, and I become the ground. The rest of the room becomes the ground. Um, and Langacker says that fundamental thing, which is a basic fact of the human condition, we pay attention to some things, and that necessarily involves not paying attention to everything else. Um, and we can only do one at a time. We can't pay attention to two figures. You can move fast between them but you can never pay attention to two things at exactly the same time, equally. Um, and if you're sitting there saying, well, I can do that, you can't. It's psychologically impossible. Um, you might think you can. You might be good at switching between the two. You might be very good at remembering backgrounded things in your short-term work in memory and bringing them back. But nobody, no human with a human brain, can focus on two things equally at the same time. Uh, there's always a figure ground, continuum. Um, that's the rabbit and the duck. That's exactly the rabbit and the duck, yeah. Yeah, or the vase face thing, you know, where there's, there's two people, yeah, it's that. You can't, you can't see both at the same time. You can't look at the corner of a room and see a cube or a corner of a room at the same time. Um, okay, so figure and ground is fundamental. So figure and ground, argues like it must be fundamental to grammar as well, uh, since grammar comes out of our consciousness too. Um, so everything can be divided into a trajectory, a thing, and a background against which that thing is, is attended to. Um, so for example, here's a sentence, a vicious dog attacked me. We've got a, a trajectory, a vicious dog, and a landmark which is attacked me. Uh, or if you like, if you want to be a bit more subtle, the attacked is the motion against which I am the landmark. So in this, the trajectory is the vicious dog, that's the thing that's doing the thing. Uh, the landmark is the background, uh, in this case, me. Um, now, I'm switching from Langacker to Talmi here. Um, Langacker describes this uh, as a billiard ball model, or a snooker ball model. Um, what do you call that? Is it billiards or snooker? You know the game that you play with? Is that? Yeah. You have that yeah. Um, so, you can see why. Uh, because there's a... Uh, they look like little balls in the diagram. Langacker loves his diagram. Um, and the idea in Talmi's force dynamics model of grammar is that the trajector has energy. This is where it starts to get a bit hippie-ish and new agey. You know, I'll, 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 I'll rein this in a little bit. In a and again, if you brought them in systemic functional linguistics, this bit sounds crazy. But, but bear with me. So the, the trajector has energy. Um, and it's, it's an energy that you, the, 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 the speaker understands when they say something like this and that the reader or hearer will, will put into that trajectory as well. So they'll be invested with, now this isn't a metaphor, actual energy from your head into the thing. Um, and the energy gets transferred, it does something. So the energy is what allows it to move. So in this case, a vicious dog is energetic, uh, and it transmits that energy down what Talbot calls an action chain, that's what the arrow is. Um, and it transmits it to, or at, or through, or destructively, or it does something to the landmark. So s things happen. And they don't happen metaphorically. This grammar is not a metaphorical model of the world. Because of its roots in, in our fundamental spatial relations, it is literally true, says Talmi, that there's energy transmitted down that action chain of the clubs. Okay. No one's going to tell me that's a little bit. 
Do you all think that's a lot of nonsense? <laughs> uh, I think you, you should distinguish be between metaphor as in cognitive linguistics and metaphor tradition. Oh, you mean there's a poetic trope? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You say it's not metaphoric. Yeah. But it is. It, well, only in the sense that, that, that consciousness is metaphoric. metaphoric. Yeah, yeah. Because there has to be a thick look at something else. So, yeah. 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 It's a basic but, cognitive mechanism. In that sense, this is metaphoric. Yeah. Okay. But if well, that's like, yeah. Well, you get hung up on this sort of sewer problem then, which is the, you know, the, the sign signifier thing. So this, to say that this is a pen, is of course at a fundamental level metaphorical, because there are all sorts of other words in other languages that could stand for this object. So to that extent, it's representational. But if I say this is a, this is a screwdriver, this, this is a chisel, this is a lever, because I can prise the front of this off with this pen, I probably can't, but somebody's had a go at that. <laughs> um, but, you know, you said, so it's, it's, it's a tool, it's a, it's a chisel. That's more metaphorical than it's a pen, even though philosophically they're both metaphorical. Is that, is that all right? Mm -hmm. I'm cheating on it. <laughs> um, okay, let, let me just quote Talmi. Talmi says this is, this is not metaphorical, this is, this is literally true. There is literally energy uh, in, in the action chain. Um, and that's, that's why it has an effect on us, because you have to do, you expend, you provide the energy in interpreting this, just as the writer or speaker of this has expended energy in putting the energy into the thing that's then sort of kinetically available later on for somebody to, to reinvigorate it. Um, I told you it sounded crazy. Okay, so we've got a vicious dog attacked me um, as, a, as a simple sort of clause analysis. Now, one of the... If it was just that, then cognitive grammar is simply another way of labelling a clause, isn't it? But what we've got here, of course, is we still, like systemic functional linguistics can do, it can talk about what's prominent or what what's comes first, or what's thematised, what's theme read and so on. Um, and of course, what we've got here is the emphasis on a vicious dog. It's not just a dog, it's a vicious dog. It's, it wasn't, uh, I, I was attacked by a vicious dog. It's a vicious dog attacked me. And it matters that it's that way around. Um, so what we've got here is more attention on the trajector than the landmark. Now, trajectors are always a bit more attentionally drawing attractive than landmarks anyway, because they're trajectors, not landmarks. But even beyond that, you can, as Langer calls it, profile the clause so that you're actually paying much more attention to the trajector than would, if you like, ordinarily be the case. And you can see this if I do the other way around. Here's another sentence. A dog attacked me as I was walking down along the quiet road. Now what we've got here is still the same sort of thing, still a trajectory which is definitely the dog, still a landmark which is definitely attacked me as I was walking along the quiet road, still a figure ground, no question about that. Um, but the, the way that that's framed puts loads more attention, doesn't it, on the ground, on the landmark stuff. So it's still energy being transmitted from trajectory to landmark, but the profiling that this offers to a, a, a receiver is all end focused. It all, it all points to what in SFG would be called the ream, uh, the, end, the end of it. Um, and Langacker represents that sort of bold in on his diagram, as I've, as I've shown there. Um, now it strikes me that that's useful. So when we, if we go back to those sort of um, uh, newspaper headlines of, of, of people getting shot at demonstrations, um, just as a basic thing, we can differentiate between the first three of those using this sort of system. Um, not just in terms of the, the clause labelling, but also in terms of what you pay more attention to uh, and what the, the, the writer of those sentences apparently would like an audience to pay more attention to um, in terms of the structure. So already we can do something that we, we very basically did uh, 10 minutes ago. Okay, this is a bit of literature. Now I, what I wanted was the most literary thing I could think of. And this, to me, is the most lyrical piece of lyric that, that, that there is in the English language. Um, this is Wordsworth's Daffodils. This is so well known that, that it's sort of um, a cliche, you know. Uh, that all, and ev everyone in Britain knows this. At least they know the first two lines. Uh, <laughs> everyone knows that Wordsworth, even if they've never read any poetry at all, they know someone who wrote a poet called something like Wordsworth, and he wrote a poem called Daffodils, who actually was never called that by him. Um, and it's about daffodils, those, those yellow flowers, you know, that you get in sort of March, April time in, in, in England. Um, 
And it's always held up as the, the, the archetypical nature poem. Um, if there's ever an anthology of nature poems, this would be in it. Um, it has to be in it. It's, it's always, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 as I said, the most lyrical of lyrics that I could, I could think of. Um, and because of that, there's an unbelievable amount of literary criticism on this. There's 200 years worth of literary criticism on this. There's tons of it. Um, so I also wanted something that I thought there was absolutely nothing new to say about it. Um, surely, after 200 years, especially over the last 50 years, everybody who's ever looked at this has said everything that could possibly be said about this. And I thought, well, even if a cognitive grammatical analysis of this can say one tiny little new thing about it, then that's sort of good, isn't it? Um, so there you go. Uh, so let me, let me read it to you. Do you know this? Yeah? Okay. Um, this is, this is Wordsworth. Do you want a bit of context or shall I just read? Okay. <laughs> All students there. I want some context. Um, okay, this uh, Wordsworth is, um, along with, uh, I guess, Coleridge uh, and Ruskin, uh, living in the late 18th, early 19th century, and mainly based in the English Lake District in the northwest of England. Uh, they are the, the preeminent romantic capital R poets uh, of, of English literature, um, and Wordsworth becomes the, the, the manifesto writer for, for romanticism. Um, and uh, Wordsworth is particularly interesting because in the, in the 1780s and 1790s, he was a radical, he was a left-wing radical. Left-wing was a term just being invented in the French Revolution then, but you know, he was, he was, yeah, was a left-wing radical. Uh, he walked across France during the French Revolution. Uh, at the end of the 1780s and the early 1790s uh, and was all in favour of it. thought it was brilliant, thought it was fantastic that the king had been overthrown um, and uh, had his head cut off um, and that the aristocracy were being removed largely, mainly Paris, but you know, uh, generally across the country and that the, 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 the enlightenment was coming uh, as far as he could see. Uh, later in life, um, after, essentially after Napoleon, uh, we realised that Napoleon was the consequence of the, of the terror of the French Revolution. Wordsworth completely changed his politics. So by the time, by the sort of 1820s and after the Battle of Waterloo and, and the 1830s, Wordsworth was very much an old reactionary conservative. Um, and he completely turned. There's a, there's a brilliant poem by Robert Browning called To, uh, to the, uh, the Lost Leader, um, which is just vicious, horrible, nasty. It says, Essentially, much more eloquently than this, words with you bastard, you let us all down. You're a turncoat, you're a, you're a traitor. Um, and Browning brilliantly does it, not just in, 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 in the content of the poem, but, but in the metrics. Uh, so he takes uh, an Alexandri, you know, the, the sort of uh, iambic hexameter uh, of, uh, of, um, of classical Greek uh, and Roman literature that Wordsworth used sometimes. Um, but he chopped the end of it. So curtail one of the feet. So what he's saying in words with is, you you used to be heroic, but you're not anymore. You know, he's doing it in the metrics. Isn't that brilliant? Um, he's writing to another poet, and he's saying to the other poet, not only are you a bastard, but I'm a better poet than you. Um, <laughs> fantastic. So, but let me backtrack. So this is Wordsworth, um, and this is the pivot point. This is 1804. Now it was published in 1807, and he, he messed around with it quite a lot because he changed many things through his career. So this is the sort of version that's been passed down as part. This is the, 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 if you like, the English literature cultural version of daffodils. Let me let me read it to you. <coughs> Deep breath. You'll see why in a minute because it doesn't let you do a breath. Um, <coughs> I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high on vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills, a 
the dancers with the daffodils. <laughs> you can see why it's, it's a popular one in, for, with, amongst teachers with school children. Because uh, it has rhymes and stuff, which is nice. Um, and it's, it's about a thing. It's a very vivid thing. Um, and most of the literary criticism of this talks about it as being it embodies the daffodils so that the poem is more daffodilly than daffodils are. Um, of course, it's entirely the wrong time of year in the wrong country for me to produce a daffodil, but I don't need to because I've got this. Uh, so there, there is some daffodils for you, quite a lot. Um, and actually, they're better than the daffodil that I could have shown you, because this is, this is essence of daffodil. This is the idea of daffodils. This is far more daffodilly um, than any mere actual daffodil. Uh, is, is the idea, um, and it's, 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 it's a preeminent nature poem. Um, I'm going to pause for two minutes, and I notice you've all got pens. You all brought pens, um, so since you might as well use those pens, um, can you do a cognitive grammatical analysis? The first time <laughs> you should you should find it easy because because I've, I've given you the picture there. So there's there's a picture on the handout. All, all you need is two two circles, a TR and an LN. An arrow between them, and then see if you can assign bits to it. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to do it because I think it's really easy. Um, you mean finding the trajectory? Yeah, yeah. What, what's the trajectory? Is that in the title? There's no title. It gets called Daffodils, this, but there's no. There, there was, it was. It was published without a title. I. 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 Is, is that it? Just I. So everything else is landmark. Okay. Uh, let me let me see if I remember whether I did this. Draw me thing. There it is. Um, so we're looking at something like that. Is that right? So where does the landmark finish? Where? Okay. Tell you what. If I, I'm going to read the first stanza, which I can't do because I've lost the poem. Um, ah, there it is. Okay. Shout stop when I get to the end of the landmark. Oh, the trajectory's going to stop at I, so you can, if I say I, you all shall stop. <laughs> okay. And now I'm going to carry on going, and when I get to the end of the landmark, and I'm, I'm sort of about to hit the next trajectory, you shall stop. I w wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Okay. You want, you said stop there. Okay. It's tricky that, isn't it? Because you're right, there's a full stop, and it's the end of the stanza. But Wordsworth's a bit sneaky, because he starts the next bit as if it runs on from that. And just in case you didn't get the hint by Wordsworth, the very next word, just to remind you of the hint, is the word continuous. So it's not clever. Um, but he, 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 it's almost like he wants you to carry on, I think. Maybe. But the trouble is, if you do that, then, then you're really in trouble, analytically, because then, then you've got a long way to go. Continuous as, it's too small for me to read, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle in the Milky Way, they stretch a never-ended line along the margins of a bay. Colon. Um, which always points you afterwards, isn't it? Colon is, is sort of catapher in essence. Um, 2,000 saw the turn their heads and sprightly dance. Definitely then finish. Now, of course, the problem with that is that there's lots of subordination. Uh, there's lots of embedded clauses within that, I wandered lonely as a cloud. Um, that, so then you've got something floats on high over vales and hills. What floats on high? Okay. So the cloud floats on high, not the eye. Yeah. So the sentence is, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills. But it's, it's, it's him that's... The sentence is about him uh, floating, like wandering, and that being like the experience of floating over vales and hills. But you're right, grammatically it makes you look at the clouds. Grammatically, in any sort of traditional grammar, you would have to say, oh yeah, that cloud is a sort of... is the, 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 the transferred subject or the deflected subject or the subject... Uh, shifted across, or, or there's a rank shift there, or whichever grammar you want to pick up, you know, they're all more or less saying the same thing, the cloud is, is, is the argument that governs the predication of uh, 
floating on high over hills and hills. But, in fact, the experience of reading this is that it's the observing consciousness of the poem, of the poet, telling you that he's floating on high over hills and hills. But the cloud is just a means to express that, isn't it? Now, cognitive grammar catches that. I don't think any other grammar catches that. Because any other grammar has to follow the subject of that subordination. Whereas if you're thinking in terms of energy flow across a clause, you've still got the residual energy of the eye keeping going through that action chain with the very long landmark structure. And this isn't just an argument about constituency, of saying that the landmark constituent, like the whole chunk, that would be the VP in the generative grammar, you know, the bit after the noun for it. Um, it isn't just identifying constituency, it's saying something fundamental about the fact that the eye is still there in your consciousness, residually, pushing the analogy. It's the eye that's experiencing that analogy. The eye is, 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 is if you like, the shell that within which the analogy of the cloud happens in the first place. Um, now I realise that that analysis is not the perfect way of capturing the sense, but it seems to me it's starting to get there. Um, of telling you something about what this is doing in a reader's head. Most readers' heads, I think. Um, there's always a problem that readers do different stuff, you know. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, we can still talk about that. And in fact, if you think it's accidental, we're talking about profiling here. So the profile is very much landmark focused, isn't it? Throughout the poem. In fact, he repeats the pattern. I saw a crowd of horses over the saw so I, 10,000 early months. A poet could not but begin such a different company. I gaze and gaze and gaze and gaze and gaze and, gaze and looked. Uh, and notice what the trajectories are in all cases. It's I, I, I really embedded in the sentence. A poet, that is I, essentially, because he's writing it, uh, made a bit more indefinite and rarefied. Uh, and then I, and then just in case you, 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 you still got any residual attention focus on the trajectory, he repeats the landmark twice, gazed and gazed. You know, we get the idea he was looking, but he really wants to emphasise it. Um, I gazed and gazed and I gazed and looked a bit more and I kept looking and I looked what I saw and look, look at all that. Um, so we've got, so still, still the trajectory is still the poet, it's still the eye, it's still the observing consciousness, but it's all about the thing, the daffodils, the scene, the stuff over there that's being seen through that consciousness. And it seems to me that when, when you look at all the literary criticism of this, and by that I mean not just the sort of... Um, uh, authoritative, academic, sort of tweedy, suit-wearing literary criticism, but also the literary criticism that you get if you just Google up this poem, uh, and you get it, you find it on people's favourite poem websites and blogs, and, and you get school children writing about what they've been doing in school today and how they hated this because the teacher made them read it. Um, but it's so right all across all of that literary criticism from the very formal academic stuff right down to what I might call the informal or civilian stuff. <coughs> I haven't got a better metaphor for that. You know, the literary criticism in the wild is what I mean. That the people do, that aren't in universities or schools. Um, almost everybody talks about how, um, not, not in these ways, but they talk about how you're, you're, you're shown the scene. You are put in the place of Wordsworth and you see what he sees. So it isn't that, it's not like uh, Manuel was to tell me about seeing a load of daffodils four or five months ago where uh, he's telling me about himself and his own experience, where I notice him. So I'm here noticing him telling me about the daffodils. What you get here is a, such a strong landmark focus that I forget about him. Uh, now clearly he's there, because you get the eye repeated. Clearly there's, a, there's an observing consciousness. But Wordsworth could hardly make that observer's consciousness smaller. One word, one letter, the thinnest letter in the language. You know, he's making it about as small as you can possibly get while still remaining sort of grammatically well-formed. Um, all of the emphasis is on the other stuff. So that the effect, either articulated very formally in the formal literary criticism or, or sort of very roughly in, in the kids' sort of website googly stuff, is that you forget, it, you forget that, there's, that, that there's a poet here and what you get is just really vividly the stuff. Uh, that you're looking at, the daffodils. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that in, in the way that it's, it's laid out. Um, now if that was all it did, that's sort of clever, but you know, one dimension. Um, well let's look at what happens at the end. 
Because I think you get something like this. Um, I'm going to talk about the final stanza in a minute. Uh, so the first three stanzas are, um, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats so high, and I saw some daffodils, and they looked like this, and they were everywhere. There were millions of them. Uh, and they were all over the place. And I kept looking at the daffodils, and they were really beautiful. And they danced around, and they seemed to be the most active thing in the entire place. And I just, what I'm telling you is, there's lots of daffodils. But it's all about daffodils. And uh, that's the first three stanzas. The final stanza takes you out of that. Let me read it again. Um, have you got a copy of this? Yeah, you have. Um, final stanza. For oft, oh, hang on a minute. So now we've got a we've got a time switch. So we're not we're no longer standing there in the scene looking at the daffodils. We're now on some repeated occasion afterwards um, that happens over and over again. For oft, where is this? When on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood. There, that is the daffodils, flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. So that stanza happens somewhere else. I, later on, and over and over again, uh, back in his house when he's lying on his, 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 his couch or, 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 or bed, um, thinking about the memory of him and recalling the memory. So in fact, the first three stanzas are his memory given to you in language. Um, and the final stanza makes that clear. Now it strikes me, what we've got here is uh, an apparent change in the process. And it's figured, it's just sort of hinted at in the final line of that <coughs> third stanza. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show that me had brought. That sentence is, let me be very informal about this, the wrong way around, isn't it? It's not everyday speech. And everyday speech is really important to Wordsworth. He, he wanted to write... Uh, what he called the, the, the conversation of everyday men uh, in ordinary language. Now I know Wordsworthy in language doesn't look very ordinary to us now, but compared with the sort of poetry that was being written before, which was very formulaic, um, th this is like everyday conversation, much more. Uh, so here he's, he's I, think, I think deliberately, it's always dangerous to say that, but I think deliberately switching it around. So you get a heavy focus, uh, is there still a heavy focus on the landmark, but it's as if the energy is going the other way. It's as if the landmark itself has all the energy. Because the show, the stuff that he was looking at, had brought the wealth back to him. It's like there's a reversal of the flow of energy on the action chain. I know I sound really so hippie-ish when I say These are the terms of the ground. And in fact, I think that's exactly what happens throughout the final stanza. So look at, look at how, pro, how prominent, weirdly, this is a really weird thing to say about it, look at how prominent the ground is, the landmark. So it's all about where this happens. For oft, often, that's grounded. When on my couch I lie, that's grounded. In, in vacant or in pensive mood. Prepositions are really important in cognitive linguistics because they are absolute spatial image schemes. In, that is actually physically, literally, not metaphorically, in a vacant or in, inside a pensive mood. He's in it. It's an object and he's in it. Um, he's literally in it. It's not a metaphor. Prepositions aren't metaphors. They are actual image schemes that we form when we're babies uh, in common linguistics. Um, so it's lots and lots of grounding in the first two lines. Only then do you get the trajectory there. Um, flash upon that, that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And you still get a bit more landmark stuff. Upon, there's another sp very heavily spatial uh, preposition, that inward eye, there's another one, which is the bliss of solitude. And off is uh, a spatial preposition as well. Because it's the thing that this thing has been taken off. Uh, so, uh, not of, rather. So it's been taken from it. You know, of, not from is another one. Uh, it's the same, essentially, preposition, conceptually. Um, so it's lots and lots and lots of landmark grounding um, in the reverse order. And then my heart, so more attention on him, with pleasure fills all by itself, and dances with the daffodils. And the daffodils are back to being landmark there. Yeah. Go on. Uh, don't you think that a landmark here could be uh, all other men? It starts uh, with lonely, ends with solitude. There's only one man. And nature works as something complementary. It's not, uh, I don't see it as a one man against the vision, the impression, okay. uh, and the feeling. 
of the daffodils, yeah. but he alone, yeah. against all other men and women, and, and oh yeah, all that yeah, you're, you're dead right. Especially because in the first three stanzas, he's gone out of his way to make it as socially inclusive as possible. The first three stanzas encompass the whole of Europe, don't they? Um, where one of those clouds is high over bales and hills, he looks down, there's, there's the whole of, of England and Europe, the entire world essentially, for, for 1800. Um, and he draws attention to a crowd and he draws attention to a host, which had both military and religious echoes in 1800 still. Um, and they are continuous as the Milky Way, there's a never ending line, there's lots of them, they're all over the place. There, there's, there's literary critical readings of this as the French Revolution. So, you know, the, what he's looking at is. is is the crowd, the, the mob, you know, the, the, the people um, in, in the daffodils. The daffodils are, are people, the, the natural uprising against oppression. Um, but I've even seen an argument that says 10,000 is a really weird number for an English poet to pick. It's not very imperial, it's much more metric. Um, and again, <laughs> this, is, this is where it gets a bit dirty, but you know, the, remember reading an article where someone said the metric system, which was essentially institutionalized in the French Revolution, and then by Napoleon fixes 10,000 as mean in France. You know, it's not, it's, not, it's not chaotic and natural, it's orderly. Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure about that. Well, um, about the Grand Old Duke of York then? Well, yeah, 10,000. Well, I would, when, when that, that's, that's got to be post, uh, that's got to be 19th century, doesn't it? So even then, it's, it's an effect, yeah. Uh, so he does, the thing is, he doesn't say, um, I saw a lot. There were millions of them. There were, he could even have said, it would have would wrecked the, the, the rhythm, but thousands saw Abbey Farms. Loads of them, there were millions of them, there were lots. But he did, he's not as big as that, he's 10,000. And not even 12,000, a dozen. You know, it's not even, it's a sort of nice decimalisation. That's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what it is, it's, it's very French decimalisation. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know, I don't, it's, it's, it's not my argument, it's a, it's a particularly literally critical argument. But, but, Coming back to what you were saying in the front, sorry, I don't know your name. Is, is, why it, it, sorry. Why 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 yeah, it, 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 you're right that he deliberately draws attention to social, the social context and the big sprawling context, so that contrastively, in this last stanza, it's all about him on his own, in contrast to all of this. So um, here you would say that the landmark is nature or daffodils, or the army and real men coming. Uh, going, uh, I mean, well, the, the, the landmark here is, certainly in the first four lines, is everything except there. So there's the trajectory, because there the daffodils are now the trajectory. So, strictly speaking, the trajectory has changed. In the first three stanzas, the trajectory is, is I. In this last stanza, the, traje tra the trajectory is the daffodils. But it's not, it's not the same landmark. Because in the first three stanzas, the landmark is the actual daffodils in the scene. Here, they are remembered daffodils. So the point in this last stanza where the daffodils become the trajector in the action chain, actually, they aren't the same daffodils. In the first three stanzas, they are real daffodils observed in nature. In this last stanza, they are remembered idea, idealizations of daffodils that he brings back to himself. They have become part of him. Um, so it isn't a straightforward reversal, which is why I've drawn the, 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 the clause analysis like that. Uh, you know, if it, if it was simply that I saw lots of daffodils, and then at the end the daffodils reminded me of stuff, um, then the, 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 the drawing would look exactly the same. It would just be that there would be different lexicalised components of TR and LM. So the TR in the first, this is getting complicated, the TR in the first three stanzas is TRI, LM daffodils, in the final stanza, TR daffodils, LM, I, the put. But it isn't as simple as that, because this isn't the same sort of daffodil. This is an idealization of daffodil. This is the essence of daffodil. This is daffodilness. Um, whereas the first three stanzas are actual daffodils. And what Wordsworth does is change the, the actual daffodils in nature into the ideal of a daffodil. And in lit crit terms, what he's doing is changing nature into the sublime. You know, he's he's idealising it. And how does he idealise it? In poetry. So poetry improves on nature because you're going to take the poem with you 
in a way that you can't take daffodils with you because after about three or four weeks they die. So the poem is better than the daffodils because it's portable. And it's better than them because it brings them back more vividly because it makes you notice them more than you did when you were actually seeing them the first time. And the poem then is better than nature. Um, so art improves on nature and poets have the power to do that. So as a construction you have perception as the same level as meaning. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But then, um, at the at a realistic level, you you can say that cloud is a trajectory as well. Well, you, yeah, you can you can and drop down the clouds. Yeah, you can you can look at the embedded beta clouds and say yeah, there's you know if you, if you just do a very simple an analysis, grammatical and cognitive grammatical analysis of that first line, two lines, then clearly it's the cloud that floats on high over hills and hills. Yeah. But if you build that into a sort of action chain structure, yeah. it's clear that there's a residual sense that I provides that cloud with the energy to carry on. So there's still a sense that I is around. I that I is the, is, the, is the consciousness that, that triggers, that starts, that's the energy source for the whole of the rest of the action chain. The eye doesn't disappear, it's just that you start, you profile the landmark so much that you don't notice the fact that... Yeah, that I understand. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'll think about it. I'm going to have to keep going. Um, <laughs> okay. The last bit of cognitive grammar that you need is, is, is on construal. Um, and it simply repeats, actually, what I've been saying. These first three stanzas are what Langacher calls sequential scanning. That is, he takes you step by step through the thing. So, um, if I, let me do his sequential scan. So I walk from the left hand side of the room across the middle to the right hand side of the room. Now the grammaticalization of that is the same sequentially as what I do. Or I could just say across the room and do the whole lot as a summary. In the first one I'm dr grammaticalizing the sequence uh, where there's a sort of match between the thing that happened and the grammaticalization. So it's sort of objective. Don't like that word at all, but you know, it's sort of objective. Whereas if I say I cross the room, I have all control of that. I summarize the whole thing, I telescope it for you, it's much more subjective. There's a subjective construal involved. Um, so it's to do with viewing position and viewpoint in cognitive linguistics. And what we've got in the first three standards is a sequential scan. You saw this, and then he saw this, and then he looked at that, 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 and it takes you bit by bit. Whereas here, you've got a summary scan that rolls it all up and brings it back to you as an isolated memory there. So you shift from an objective construal where you no longer notice the observer. And again, this matches with the plausible grammatical action chain analysis where we say the trajectory gets sort of less and less attention attached to it in the first three. Whereas the, traject the, um, the observing consciousness is much more foregrounded in this, so you see it. You construe the subjectivity, because it's there more. I did that really fast, is that all right? All I'm saying is it's, it's another dimension of cognitive grammatical analysis that in this case, at least, is all I'm going to say, matches up with the way that we read the whole thing. Okay. The problem with this is that it's, if you read Langacker's book, it's 379 pages, I think. Um, it's bad when you can remember how many of them. Um, and chapter 9, which is the very last chapter, is the shortest chapter. Um, and everything, chapters 1 to 8, take you to the level of the clothes. If you go and sort of up the rank structures, although that isn't, you don't really use rank structures in cognitive grammar. Um, so he does sort of sign symbol relationships in, in phonology and moves right up the rank structure and finishes the clause and then the final chapter is beyond the clause. Uh, <laughs> new directions is called um, beyond the clause. Uh, and Langacker says, oh wouldn't it be great if we could talk about stuff beyond the clause? Yeah, it would be. Um, <laughs> and of course it seems to me the great glory of systemic functional grammar is what it does above the clause. I know it's really good at clause and stuff, but for me, what it does with text and cohesion and coherence and discourse structures and genres and all of that stuff, that's where as a critical discourse analyst and as a literary critic, actually 
a lot of the interest lines for me. Um, I think it's really good at that. And cognitive grammar is not just really bad at it, it just doesn't do it at all. Um, so what I really need is a cognitive discourse grammar. So now we step into the realms of, of stuff that doesn't exist. Uh, so let's sort of make it up as we go along. Um, the reason that it's weird is that when cognitive linguists want to talk about stuff above the level of the clause, they jump to the psychological plane. So they start talking about frame semantics, that's, that's Fillmore, uh, schema scripts and scenarios, that's the old stuff from the 20s and 30s really, mental models, Johnson Laird and all that, um, conceptual domains, I suppose that's early name of, uh, mental spaces, for, uh, Gilles Fauconnier, Mark Turner, uh, blends conceptual integration, which is what Fauconnier and Turner now call uh, mental space stuff and blending. So they, they go for this sort of uh, world representation bit to do coherence and register and genre and all of the global stuff. Um, and then separately, of course, there's all of the stuff that I've been talking about, which is the symbolic value of cognitive linguistics and image schemes and figure and grounded action change and constructional schemes. Now, to, a, to someone brought up in systemic functional linguistics, they look completely separate. In fact, stepping from here to here is to step out of one department into another one. Um, to go from your linguistics department into your psychology department. Um, and, and so, to, to, to absolutely jump ship in terms of which model you're doing. Cognitive linguists don't see that there's a problem here, because they just say, oh yeah, it's just all cognitive science. So this is the linguistic <laughs> bit of it, and this is the psychology bit of it, and you know, we don't, we don't think they're different at all. But to me, there's a real sort of sense that you're changing, there's a disjunction between the two. Um, and you can see this, so lexicon and grammar, according to Langacker, form a gradation consistent solely in assemblies of symbolic structures. Now he's talking about the gradation. He's saying, essentially, it seems to me, that you can, this is right at the beginning of that book, that there is a connection right up to discourse. Though in fact, uh, 274 pages, 374 pages later, he doesn't do it himself. He just sort of stops and says, ooh, it'd be interesting. Um, now it strikes me that there is a way of connecting the two together that's consistent with cognitive linguistics and cognitive psychology. And that way is called text world theory. And that's what I want to do this afternoon. Um, so I just want to, to give you sort of an advance notice of where we're going next. Because that cuts across this in, in odd and interesting ways, it seems to me. And part of the difficulty in trying to build a cognitive discourse grammar is you've got to forget about these categories because everything is the same at all different levels in cognitive grammar. The same principles have to apply right across the board. Now I know that in, in the grammars that use rank structure, these are just analytical conveniences in order to do it. The language as it's coming out of my mouth isn't sort of chunked up like that, in fact. Um, but still, if it struck me that you can talk about action chains, in fact, while we were talking about the, the, the Wordsworth poem, um, we were actually cheating a bit on Talby's very tight model. Um, because we were talking as if the energy could flow across clauses. And in fact, Wordsworth, it seems to me, in the syntax, encourages you to do that. Um, so if we can do that, why, why, not, why not do it? And why, not, why not just sort of say, yeah, let's do that. Um, and I pitched this idea from Langacker. It's very brief, it's only half a page. He talks about dominion, the notion of dominion. What he means is that, suppose you have an idea, like daffodils, for example. As soon as daffodils get activated in your head, you might picture a daffodil, a thing. Uh, or if you're like me, because I've been doing this, I'll think of Wordsworth. Um, or I'll think of a, a place near where I was brought up called Farmdale in, in North Yorkshire which is famous for its daffodils. The entire valley is full of daffodils in, in sort of early April. Um, or I'll think of a car that my auntie used to have called a daff, which was the most rubbish car that's ever been invented, a daffodil car. I think they did it in Holland. Uh, but they, they were basically like a, a, a vacuum cleaner engine with a car built around it. It was, sort of, it was like the Dutch equivalent of Eastern European cars. You know, it was a terrible car things kept falling off it. So I'm reminded of that. So daffodil has all sorts of associations for me. Um, schematic domain associations, if you like, that are ready to go. So all of these gives me 
is my uh, my flower. That's my car. That might be my memory of my auntie who died a couple of years ago. Is still part of that emotional experience of what a daffodil is. Um, daffodils in Farndale, being in Farndale as a kid with my mum and dad. Um, you know the, the the feeling of smell and sort of musky muskiness of a daffodil. Uh, a daffodil where the, the, the stamen of it stained the wallpaper of my house when I had them in a vase and they took ages, I had to repaint the wall, it was really annoying. You know, so all of that. So we've got, uh, if you like, what you would normally think of as the denotation of a daffodil, which is probably that one, primarily. But all lots of other associations, some of which are denotational, some of which are connotational, some of which are associated, some of which are really inferential and way down the line, and are peculiar to me that you don't share. Um, and all of us have those slightly differently. So daffodil comes, and in the cognitive psychology, it says that when you get a lexical item doing like that, it activates a set of possibilities ready for whatever the next thing is to narrow it down. And that's an optimality, uh, sorry, a, 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 an efficiency mechanism, because if you have to have every single possibility of every word in the, in the lexicon that you have ready to go next, you wouldn't be able to process language fast enough. So what clearly we are doing is narrowing it down ready to like one of several possibilities. It's debatable as <coughs> how many possibilities there are. Seven, apparently. But, um, you know, chunk it down. So that when the next thing comes, which is, oh, this is daffodils in a field in the Wordsworth poem. They're actually flowers, not rubbishy cars, or your memory of being in a, a, a Yorkshire Valley when you were six years old. Um, this one's ready to go. Now, it struck me that what we've got is a prototypical arrangement of foreground and background here. So this one becomes the prominent one. These don't disappear. They're still sort of around. I can't read words with daffodils or see a daffodil without having that residual sense of Farmdale when I was five and six years old. I, I just can't do it. I can't lose that association. Um, it's sort of there as a resonance, you know, as part of my memory. It influences the way that I treat daffodils. So clearly, in a poem like this, it's going to influence the way that I read the poem. Now, I know that the daffodil in the Wordsworth poem is the particular sort of flower daffodil that he's talking about in the Lake District in a particular time in the 1800s. But this other stuff is also around. So what I've got is a sense of, um, if you like, association to go with the denotation. Then I've also got what we were doing just a bit ago, which is treating the action chair not as that, but as something which carries on through other clauses. So the action chair, the energy, is transmitted across clauses, and in fact across, you know, sentence and stanza boundaries as well, uh, graphologically. Um, it strikes me that doing that, although Langacker doesn't do it, um, isn't inconsistent with cognitive linguistics. If you're going to introduce the idea of action chains and energy across clauses, and some, so the next clause picks up thematically, cohesively, on the thing that went before, then clearly that's the, the energy just carrying on, <coughs> unless something blocks it. So I can imagine a cognitive discourse grammar which talked about, it's going to get a bit hippie as you get here, folks, um, energy flow across a text and energy flow that gets stopped up or blocked or deflected. Can't we do that? If Langacker can do what he does, and Talby can do what he does, can't we do this? Why can't we do it? In principle, it's exactly the same. All it does is extend, beyond the clause boundary, the same principles. And he says, I like the quotation, he says you're allowed to do it. And the basic principles of cognitive science, that everything is continuous and everything is connected to everything else, so you should be able to do it as well. So since there's nothing to say we can't do it, why don't we do it? And see whether we can, we can work it out. Um, at this point, that's as far as I've got. So we've got half an hour left to, to invent the cognitive discourse grammar. Are you up for it? Should we, should we have a go? Okay, here's, here's a text that I think might work quite well. Uh, you've got this on your handout because I don't think anybody's eyesight is good enough to read that on the screen. Sorry. Um, this is um, so I'm sitting at home uh, in, in, my, in, my, in front of my computer, and the room's full of books, um, mainly novels and poetry because I keep all my sort of academic e books at work. Uh, and I thought, well, what I need is something I need somewhere lots is happening. I need like lots of action. 
Uh, so I turned around, the very first thing that I saw was Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, the three books. And I thought, right, I'll go for that one. I picked the middle book, which is called The Two Towers. Uh, and um, bought the book right in the middle. And right in the middle of the middle book of The Lord of the Rings, almost page for page right in the middle, is the battle between Gandalf and the Balrog in the mines of Moria. How well do you know The Lord of the Rings? Even if you've not read the book, you've seen it. Um, so, so there's the bit where Gandalf the wizard fights this hideous monster of fire uh, in the mines of the ground on a bridge. Um, and uh, Gandalf and the monster, Gandalf manages to stop the monster and all of the orcs, they're basically the, the sort of fascist baddies, uh, coming towards him. Um, uh, and he saves the company, that is the hobbits and, and the other lot who were trying to get the ring back in the, in the Mordor. I can't remember, is this the order in my head? No. Um, uh, but in the process, Gandalf is killed and they both end up falling into the fighting pit. And of course, because he's a wizard, Gandalf comes back later on as, as some of this other sort of character. So he was Gandalf the Grey and he comes back as Gandalf the White. So, there you go. Um, this, this is the scene, and I thought, this, this, is, this is a really good action scene for being able to talk about this stuff. <clears throat> Something was coming up behind them. What I want you to do is, as we're reading it, try and think of the, of the energy flow across this. Forget that you are grammarians and think in terms of New Age Hickory. <laughs> Something was coming up behind them. What it was could not be seen. It was like a great shadow, in the middle of which was a dark form of man shape, maybe, yet greater. And a power and terror seemed to be in it and to go before it. It came to the edge of the fire and the light faded as if a cloud had bent over it. Now look, cloud normally, denotationally, is just a cloud, isn't it? But how many of your heads have got words with cloud in right now? Because uh, we only just did it. It strikes me that's a dominion trace of the thing that we just did because of the context where we were, you know. Um, it's unbelievably difficult to account for that in any other grammar but this, uh, even though it's experientially real. Well, it is for me. I'm inviting you to decide whether it was for you or something. I'll shut up now, carry on reading. Then with a rush, it leapt across the fissure. The flames roared up to greet it and wreathed about it, and a black smoke swirled in the air. Its streaming mane kindled and blazed behind it. In its right hand was a blade like a stabbing tongue of fire. In its left, it held a whip of many thumbs. In Tolkien's <laughs> doesn't he? He said, I love, I love the writing. Aye, aye, will, Legolas. A Balrog, a Balrog is come. A Balrog, what a Gandalf. Now I understand it. He faltered and leaned heavily on his staff. What an evil fortune, and I am already weary. I just want to pause there. Um, is there anything that's going through your head while you're thinking about this as energy flow? Talk to me. I'm going to have a drink. You, you, you talk to me. You don't have to draw little circles of TRs now, empty. Just tell, tell me in general what it feels like. Something was coming up behind him. What it was could not be seen. It was like a great shadow in the middle, which was a dark form. Man shape, maybe yet greater than power and terror. It came to the edge of the fire. Then the rush it left it across. Tell me about the trajectory. What is it? Only okay. something. Yeah. Electrical lighting. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not there, is it? It's, it's minimal. It's vague. It's ill defined. It's just. It's almost like a grammatical empty placeholder of the thing with no content to it. Um, uh, it's charged with um, a mystery. Mystery. Absolutely, yeah, precisely because this is clearly a very strongly profiled trajectory. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's right in the field of your attention. It's the thing that you're supposed to be paying attention to. And of course, what this is, is focalised through the company who were standing on the other side of the bridge looking through past Gandalf, the, the thing that's coming and they don't know what it is. So it, it's grammatically catching that, that, that fear of the unknown. And it's, something's coming, something really big, something really big and horrible. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's really big and horrible, but I'm not going to tell you. It's really, really big and frightening and scary, and you'll be terrified of it, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> oh, you'll be so scared. It's fiery and it's dangerous, and it's coming and it's getting bigger and noisier, and it's coming your way, and it's coming towards you. But I'm not going to tell you what it is. That's what he's doing, isn't it, in, in the first paragraph or two? Yeah. And then this feeling is, is charged, uh, is extended with behind. 
That's right, it was coming up behind them. Oh my God, it's not even coming up here from the front. You can't even see it, you know. Um, what it was could not be seen. Um, it was like a great shadow. It wasn't even a great shadow, it was just like a great shadow. It wasn't even like a definite shadow, it was a great shadow. In the middle of which was something even more shadowy. Um, maybe like a man. Of, not, not even like a man, of man shape, maybe, yet yeah, bigger than that. Whatever it is that you think it is, it's bigger than the thing that you're terrified of. Um, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Not only in terms of the lexical choices that make the thing bigger. And remember, in visual field dynamics, big things are close things. Little things are far away. So, so things that get bigger, either in size or noise or volume or light, ordinarily, are <coughs> nearer you. What's weird about this is that the light-dark polarity is inverted. So the nearer it gets to you, the darker it gets. That's really discomforting, it seems to me, because everything else is lined up. It gets closer and it gets bigger, it gets closer and it gets noisier, it gets closer and it gets more scary, like if I throw something at you, you know, and it goes, <laughs> it's natural. It's like, oh, scary, it's coming towards me, it's getting bigger, I've got to get out of the way, it's dangerous. All of those line up. But it should also then, as it gets closer, you get brighter, but it doesn't, it gets dark. That's weird, that's dissonant, that's, that's not, not right. Um, okay, but there's, there's brightness associated with it, so it's on fire, basically. Its streaming main kindled blaze behind its right hand was a blade like a stabbing tongue of fire in its left, it held a whip of many thumbs. All your attention is on this thing, which is unnamed. And then it gets named, I, I will, Legolas, a Balrog, a Balrog is called. So he, he names this thing. Then there's a pause, I've only missed a sort of sentence I've just on the line. Then you get a Balrog muttered Gandalf. Not cried Gandalf or wailed Gandalf, but something with very low energy. Really is quiet. Now, here, not moving, I understand. It's a cognitive mechanism, it's not a the Balrog is doing stuff, it's moving more to Gandalf is still. And just in case you didn't get the idea, he faltered, how weak is that? And leaned heavily on his staff. What an evil fortune I am, I am already weary. So we've got Balrog, bright, big, dangerous, unnamed, then named, moving towards you, terrifying thing coming, it's all action chain. Huge amount of energy jumping across all of those clauses, the same energy, the Balrog, it's lexically, cohesively very tight, isn't it? There's, 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 a, there's a concept repetition, even if not a lexical repetition, of the thing. It, it maintains the reference chain all the way across those first two, two paragraphs. And then Gandalf, by contrast, is very weak, very still. And of course, the whole point of this passage is that Gandalf is the obstruction to this movement. And at the beginning, it's clear that that's not going to happen, is it? The Balrog is going to flatten him. Because he's weak, and the Balrog is really strong. Um, we're running out of time here, so I'm going to have to go through this fast. Um, the dark figure streaming with fire raced towards them. The orcs yelled and poured over the stone gangways. Look at the energy and movement still going on. Then Boromir raised his horn and blew. Loud the challenge rang and bellowed like the shout of many throats under the cavernous roof. For a moment, the orcs quailed and the fiery shadow halted. Now look at this. It's, it's, this is a grammatical battle going on. I mean, there's a, there's a sort of actual battle going on as well, but the grammar copies it. The grammar encodes the same as it's signifying. Seems to me. So the Balrog has all the energy at the beginning, and Gandalf is weak. Then the, the, the company rouse themselves, and the orcs are obstructed for a second. The enemy is obstructed. And this happens on a bridge as well. And the rest of the passage is all about who has the energy to and fro, uh, moving and not moving. How, they, how these, these objects participate in the spatial frame that's being set up in your head. Um, so the, the, the Balrog comes, and then they're weak, and then they get a bit of energy, and it stops, and then it gathers its energy and comes at them again, and then they, they look weaker and weaker and weaker, and then he stops it again uh, at the line, exactly halfway down. Uh, fire came from his nostrils, but Gandalf stood firm. You cannot pass, he said. The orc stood still, and a dead silence fell. It's right in the middle of the passage, which is right in the middle of the middle book of the Lord of the Rings. Almost to the word, that is the middle word of the Lord of the Rings. You cannot pass, he said, the orcs stood still and a dead silence fell. You don't know what's going to happen next. So it's, 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 it's not only the pivotal moment 
uh, in terms of the whole book, so that, uh, of what's going to happen, whether good or evil are going to triumph. Um, but it's grammatically the pivotal moment as well. And all the energy stops. The Balrog made no answer. Nothing happens. He's just, ex and he's, he's, in language terms, he's working in an experiencer role. Um, these are the participant roles that are roughly equivalent to the participant roles that you get in systemic functional linguistics. Um, after that, Gandalf doesn't do anything. The things that he has do things. So Glandring, which is the name of his soul, does something. It glittered white in answer. Clearly Gandalf does something, but there was a ringing clash and a stab of white fire. It's like the trajector, if I was to draw this, the profile would be very, very much off the trajectory of Gandalf and would be on the other stuff. It'd actually be on the trajectory here, the process. Um, there was an existential, there was a ringing clash and a stab of white fire. The Balrog fell back. The wizard swayed on the bridge, stepped back a pace and then again stood still. You can't pass. So the wizard is the obstruction that stops the energy. The Balrog is trying to send its energy across the clauses to win, grammatically. Um, and this is a grammatical battle. And the consequence of it is that Gandalf becomes, in Langrecker's terms, a participant that simply moves. He receives the energy, but in the process of that, of soaking up all this energy, he becomes part of the landmark and they both crash down into the ground. Now I'm very aware in saying all this that I'm jumping between ground and landmark in the grammatical sense and ground in the if you like, ordinary language sense. But I go back to what I started off by saying that I don't think that's, that's a real terminological solution. Because, because in the terms of cognitive linguistics, when you talk about figure and ground in closed terms, you are talking literally about them in spatial terms and experiential terms as well. So the fact that this matches up with the experience of the battle scene is all part of the deal. Um, and I think you can do it. Now clearly, what I've done is, is a very rough sketch. I think you could draw this. I think you could spend like three or four days drawing it out and doing the analysis. And I, I'm fairly sure it would work. But I stand before you today right now, nearly run out of time in this session, saying I haven't actually done it. I've done a sketch of it. I've sort of written it up a bit. I don't know whether you can do it or not. Um, and just to prove that that's the case, uh, these, these two examples that I'm... I'm not going to go into an any detail at all, but I'm going to leave you to think about it while you go and have a cigarette, um, or whatever you want to do about that. Um, these are from a few days ago, uh, from the BBC website, so I wanted to do that just so that you would know I didn't have time to actually do any analysis of this. So I'm really not sure whether these work. This first one is uh, a report from Livia. I just want to show you what it looks like in its context. So it looks like that. It's on, it's on your handout. Lydia conflict, Gaddafi sons left Bali Wally. Um, it looks like that. So the text down here, there's a couple of pictures. You get these side things here. There's a little thing which will play if I click that. Um, there's the report. Then sort of yeah, embedded in it, there's this analysis by uh, BBC's correspondent in Tripoli, Jeremy Bowen. That bit there, which I've also put on your handout. And then it, there's this sort of little call out bit here with links to other stories and a map um, showing where Bani Walid is uh, in relation to Tripoli and Benghazi and so on. And that's what, the, the, that's what it looks like in context. Um, then it struck me that this felt different when I read it. I apologise for this. This is a report of a football game that England unusually won. Um, and I know Spain are the best football team in the world, so I'm just going to put this in money. This is England beating Bulgaria, in Bulgaria, last week. Um, and there's the report. So you get a picture of the game, uh, some inarticulate nonsense from John Terry, um, and there's the report. Uh, uh, Fabio Capello on the radio saying yeah, they did alright. Um, and then match facts at the bottom. So that, that's what that looks like. Now it simply struck me that when I was looking at these, because I read it more or less on the same day, that one felt different from the other. That, that, that's all. And it strikes me that if, if a comedy of discourse grammar can do anything, it should be able to tell you why one feels different from the other. Um, now clearly that's a matter of genre, obviously. Um, but it's also a matter of the way that it's written, 
and that's a consequence of genre and register. Um, but there's something different about the, the content of them as well. Uh, the, the first one, the Libya one, is about a battle that isn't going well, because um, it's very confused. I don't know where Gaddafi is still. Uh, and um, there's uncertainty. And in the other one, it's a report of a football game that England pretty much dominated all the way through. So England do lots of stuff in the sports report, and Bulgaria do virtually nothing. So England are trajectors, and Bulgaria are very much landmarks in that, in that report. Whereas in the first one, it isn't that the rebel army uh, in Libya is not even, even saying that it's not a thing, is it? That these separate bunches of people are doing things, and Gaddafi and the Gaddafi supporters are not doing things because the rebel army is very fragmented, and they do things that work and don't work, and then they don't do things, and the report's as much about what doesn't happen as what does happen, and then nothing gets resolved. Um, it struck me they felt different. And an analysis of it would tell you how it felt different. Uh, so I'll tell, let me show you how far I've got. Um, and you can read these yourselves uh, in the break. It seems to me the Libya report is very fragmented. There's lots of stop-start. So what you're not getting, unlike the Tolkien and battle example, is a lovely free flow of, of action, energy going across chained action chained across a dominion structure. See how easily we can drop into the terminology. Um, what you actually get is a stop, start, stop, start. A switching of trajectory and landmark of who's who. Uh, one moment the rebel army is a trajector, then it's Gaddafi, then it's Gaddafi's spokesman, then it's uh, uh, somebody else, you know, the, the NATO military commander. It keeps switching all over the place. Um, the experience of role is prominent. Nothing happens, but people say lots of things. Um, Agency is constantly blocked, it seems to me. Have a look at that as well. Um, by contrast, the football report is grammatically free-flowing. It's, it's very, very fluent. There's almost no blockages because Bulgaria was so rubbish. Um, so it's just, it's just about sweeping moves across the pitch. This happened, and then 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 this happened, and then, this happened, and then the game ended. It's almost, it's unbelievably cohesive and free flowing, uh, and, and uh, the energy is unobstructed. It just goes straight across every clause without anything in the way, almost. Um, they are very long action chains. So the sentences are very long, say, crude rip up there. But all the clauses pick up on the previous clause in a very, very tightly cohesive way. So in a dominion chain, the thing that this is going to become is the most expected thing that it was. In other words, it doesn't do something weird. It's not like a surrealist poem where the least expected thing is the thing that it becomes. And you get this sort of non secretaire thing going on in the clause structure. In the football report, because it's unbelievably tightly generically controlled as a register, what you get is it's about football. They're talking about players. The players are the ones that you think they're going to talk about. And the player that gets talked about here is the same player that gets talked about here. So it keeps talking about the England football team, and they remain the constant trajector all the way through. Um, there's no deviation from it. There's nothing unexpected about it. There's no dissonance. There's no fiddling around. It is what it is. And it is what it is perfectly. Um, unlike the Libya report. Uh, the only odd bit at the end, of that football room. There's only an odd bit at the end where it seems to be it slows down. Uh, where clearly the football team took their foot off the accelerator because by then they knew they won. Um, and then grammatically it mirrors that as well. Now I've just given you a very summary analysis of it. And you know, there, there's, that's the picture of that. And that's what I wrote down. So you can see it's not a very extensive analysis. But everything I've just said is it. Um, so, have a look at that yourself. Um, see whether you think I'm right. Um, and if you think I'm right, then we can probably do a cognitive discourse graph. And if we can do that, then I think we should. Because um, it looks like it might work. So thank you all very much indeed for, for being here this morning. I'm going to give you a break now. I'm going to stay here, because I've got my own walk. And if anyone wants to talk to me for half an hour now, please do come and talk to me. Uh, I'll be here. Um, and then we're going to come back in half an hour's time, roughly, 